three rockets launch on the same day. This madness now on KNews. Hi, Lucas here and welcome to KNews for week 22-2017. Yep, all three launches this week are scheduled for tomorrow. First up is for Japan H2A. It will take off right after midnight from the Tanegashima Space Center. H2A will fly in its 202 configuration which stands for two core stages, no liquid fuel boosters and two solid rocket motors. They initially planned to use more of these variants but only two ended up being used, 202 and 204. The four tanks in the center are filled with hydrogen and oxygen which makes the rocket engines below its stage very efficient but the tanks themselves rather big in comparison. Behind the fairing is a satellite for Japan's Quasi Zenith satellite system named QZS2. Quasi or Quasi is a German word by the way and is often used in science to describe a simplified process which replaces a complex one with almost the same outcome. In this case it means instead of launching one satellite which could somehow hover over Japan at the northern hemisphere as the earth rotates around, multiple ones are launched which orbit in different tundra orbits. Each of those is geosynchronous but highly inclined and reaches its highest point right when Japan rotates below it. This makes the system quasi behave like a single satellite on a halo orbit. To get into the orbit the rocket will head southeast and instead of burning at the equator to achieve a regular geosynchronous transfer, it will wait a little longer to push the air perhapses higher so to speak. The rest is pretty similar. The main purpose of this system will be navigation by the way. Japan's cities are crowded and filled with tall buildings. A GPS signal is therefore best received right from above and that is exactly what Zenith stands for. So the signal doesn't reflect around buildings so much, enhancing the accuracy due to the direct line of sight between the satellite and a receiver like a car or smartphone. Next up to launch is a SpaceX Falcon 9 at 2155 UTC from Cape Canaveral in Florida. Yep, the booster will be reusable again and therefore attempts to land. However, the booster will be a brand new one, unlike the Dragon capsule up top. Yes, this will be the first time SpaceX will use a used Dragon capsule. I'm not sure though how much of Dragon will be flight proof hardware but it's a great step towards full reusability nonetheless. As all Dragon missions in the recent past, the rocket will head to the ISS and is therefore part of the commercial resupply services. It will be the 11th flight for Dragon V1 to the ISS and there will be 12 in total. This means the time we will see a Dragon V2 fly for the first time comes closer since NASA contracted SpaceX for more missions using its new capsule. On board CRS-11 are all sorts of crew supplies like food or experiments. A more prominent payload inside the unpressurized trunk is NICER or the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. It's an instrument which will be mounted on the ISS since it needs a similar orbit and using a dedicated satellite will be much more expensive. As the name indicates it will observe neutron stars. These bodies form after stars have burned out and collapse after they have blown up as a nova. Neutron stars are very interesting because they came very close to become black holes. While we cannot directly observe a black hole, we can observe neutron stars and maybe learn more about these along the way. But neutron stars also have purposes beyond pure science. They spin really fast in the order of multiple revolutions per second. This is because when a rotating star collapses, it keeps all of its rotational momentum. Like a ballerina which pulls her arms together, it gains speed as it shrinks. This rotation together with a neutron star's radiation is like a fingerprint for them. Each is a little different which means one could use them to navigate through the space. So it is therefore important to characterize as many of them as possible and also observe how they change over time. Once Dragon is released it will as usual catch up with the station on a lower orbit and arrive two days later. The last launch for this week and also for June 1st is an Ariane 5 launching from Kourou at 2345 UTC. Similar to H2A it has two core stages filled with hydrogen and oxygen which get supplemented by two really strong boosters. These allow Ariane 5 to carry two communication satellites at once to a geosynchronous transfer orbit. On board this time are Utilsat 172B and the record breaking Viasat 2. If everything goes according to plan it will break the record for the highest data rate from space with 300 gigabits per second. Launching to a geosynchronous transfer orbit Ariane 5 will head east towards Africa. The trajectory won't be much different from H2A's but will of course push the apoapsis above the equator since the final destination of both satellites is a geostationary orbit with almost no inclination at all. They have to stay at a certain spot since people will point their dishes towards them and nobody wants a varying signal from a shifting satellite. 
Viaset 2 will be placed at 70 degrees west of America from where it will deliver internet services for the company Exceed Internet. So Exceed customers can look forward to a boost in speed I guess. However, due to the position 35,000 km away, the latency will remain relatively high but that doesn't really matter for applications like streaming video which accounts for the most internet traffic these days. Especially 4K content requires a really high bandwidth. Utilsat 170B on the other hand will be placed at 172 degrees east which is somewhere above Australia and Papua New Guinea. Once Ariane's upper stage burns out it will first release Viaset, then the Zilda cover and lastly Utilsat. Both satellites will continue on their own and circleize the orbits in the following weeks. So it will take quite some time before they will begin their duty. Ok, that shall conclude episode 87 and I hope to see you next one if you like. Auf Wiedersehen and thank you for watching.